dystopian times. So before we talk about this, uh, this is the Elijah McClain story. I just want to play a clip. Now, usually I don't go out of my way to promote MSNBC segments. Having said that, though, it's a really concise segment that summarizes the story. And the anchor's response was very human. And, and it's really nice to see that. So let's let's watch and then we'll uh, we'll get to the update here and then the panel uh, will react. And, and David Henderson, one of the things that's so particular about this case is as you mentioned, based on everything we know about it, there was no reason for Elijah McClain to have been stopped in the first place. Somebody saw him walking at night. He had a ski mask on. Uh, he said he was cold. It is, was Colorado. And he said he was anemic, and that's why he had a, a ski mask on. And then he was set upon by police and was drugged by paramedics. They gave him 500 milligrams of this powerful sedative. This kid was five foot six, weighed 140 pounds, and they gave him enough sedative that you would give to somebody who weighs 220 pounds. And his final words are haunting and tragic. He says, God, he says, I can't breathe. He says, I can't breathe. I have my ID right here. My name is Elijah McLean. That's my house. I was just going home. I'm an introvert. I'm just different. That's all. I'm so sorry. I have no gun. I don't do that stuff. I don't do any fighting. Why are you attacking me? If Elijah McClain isn't safe, who is? Who is David Henderson, Paul Butler? Who's safe? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that, that's why we're here. And I appreciate you drawing attention to what's important. Yeah, so this, I mean, seeing him, like, watching this clip for the first time, it really, like, it struck a nerve in me. Um, and I wanted to share that clip because he gives you some background into, you know, Elijah McClain's last words and whatnot. But I do have an update to that story. Um, so this is from the Daily Beasts. Zoe Richards uh, writes, three cops, two paramedics hit with 32 count indictment in Elijah McClain's death. A district attorney initially cleared the cops who tackled McClain on the ground uh, but it took public outrage and an independent investigation to prompt a new inquiry. So a grand jury has returned a 32 count indictment against two Aurora police officers, one ex officer and two local para paramedics and the death of Elijah McLean. Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser said on Wednesday, all five defendants, Aurora police officers, Randy Rodina and Nathan Woodyard, uh, former officer Jason Rosenblatt and fire paramedics Jeremy Cooper and Lieutenant Peter Chichunek. Uh, sorry, I'm butchering their names, but y you get the point. Uh, um, face one count of manslaughter and criminally negligent homicide. Now, the attorney general has stated that, you know, these cases are really difficult to prosecute, so don't get your hopes up. But I think that the mere prospect of justice for Elijah McClain, the fact that we're seeing these indictments, it it's a little bit of hopium. I mean, Josie, uh, do you want to speak to this issue? Because, you know, this is... This is one story of many that we've seen, and it's really, it's exhausting. And I think that to this point, many people just don't even expect any sort of justice whatsoever. And even when we get justice, as was the case with George Floyd, it doesn't feel like we won because he's still gone. So can you can you give us some some um, some of your thoughts on this topic, Josie? Well, uh, first, first, immediately is just the emotional outrage, just the emotional outrage of how just just blatant all of this is and that another kid is dead and 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 the thing that you know and going back to you know the way the republicans and talk about oh is systemic racism real uh critical race theory bad and they just start going all down this road of like how like racism doesn't exist and that if we talk about racism and yet they are the first ones to cry about how we had protests that prolonged across the streets of this country and say that those were violent when 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 what else is there like, like, it, like, if we're quiet and peaceful about it, another kid is dead without justice. And then when we get mad and angry about the injustices in this country, all of a sudden, the, the, the people who are on the streets are bad, just for a scrap of justice, a scrap of justice. Now, now we're starting to see that we have some more district attorneys being elected now where they're starting to take these things seriously. We're starting to see a little bit of move, growth and movement in the justice system, but that's not everywhere. 
So, so we may have justice in some cities, but what about the other cities that are still starving and thirsting for just the monicum of the ability to basically walk around and live in your own communities? So I know my reaction, you know, you went to me first because my reaction is the most emotional on that because after seeing that, it's like how many more times do we have to continue to live this story? It's like, it's, it's the title of the show is perfect, dystopian times. Like it is, it is absolutely dystopian that we continue yeah. to live this over for decades now, decades. And it just yeah. breaks my heart. Yeah, and, and one thing about this is, you know, the conversation about policing and black communities being targeted, that was finally something that white Americans, I think, were privy to because of the Black Lives Matter movement. But Jordan's reporting really highlights how it's not just racism and policing like this truly is an institutional issue. Uh, I, I know that you reported on an Amazon uh, worker. Uh, I, I believe her name was Push on Brown. Is that correct, Jordan? Yes. Yeah, how she basically was, um, you know, there, there were no worker protections. She ended up dying from COVID after Amazon forced her, someone who's not a medical professional, to administer COVID-19 tests. On top of that, you know, uh, we see communities of color disproportionately affected by uh, COVID-19. Every single issue, it always hits communities of color the hardest. Uh, we're seeing Line 3, the Enbridge pipeline, hitting uh, indigenous communities. So at what point, Jordan, do you think that America actually has a serious conversation about institutional racism and white supremacy? Because I feel like every time we begin to have that conversation, the conversation gets co-opted by the right and Fox News and all of these propagandists who want to distract us from having this very serious discussion. Yeah, I don't want to minimize what you're saying, but I, I don't think we need a conversation. I think we need radical action now. Because yeah. conversation, I mean, you always hear that on cable news after this, whether it be mass shootings, whether it be, it, it, it's just, uh, I know you don't mean it that way, but it's just a phrase right. to kind of kick the can down the rule. Bottom line, there's several things wrong. Tina's seen it. I've seen it. Number one, you can't have police. If they're in, involved in an incident, that's the end of the road. They're not the ones that should be filing police reports, which time and time again, they lie in the police reports, and then it goes to internal affairs, which is basically the CIA of police. Internal affairs is just basically HR for police to protect them. So if a police officer is involved in, an, in a situation like this, they go in their corner. There needs to be independent, community-led uh, oversight of every police department in America. Sure, you could have sprinkle in there former police um, social workers, what have you, but it, it's like an arsonist going to burn down a building. And then like the arsonist goes and files the report on what happened. I mean, it's insane. The second thing, and it kind of reminds me of the Trayvon Martin murder, but we need to start talking about people making 911 calls in this country. Mm -hmm. I know the whole, I know the whole thought is, you know, if you see something, say something. And sure. If you see an empty suitcase in the middle of a subway, maybe, you know, that, could be problematic but when you get to this people with their own biases calling 911 because something seems suspicious and then you have police departments who are inherently full of racist people well that's a recipe for disaster so why if, if somebody on 911 is calling and they're not reporting a crime okay why are the police going out in the first place in the, in the case of elijah mclean they said, I mean, it was decided that they had no legal right to even approach him for quote unquote being suspicious. And the, and the third thing uh, I will say, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know if you could get justice. Maybe you could say accountability. But if you want to talk mm -hmm. about COVID contract tracing, 20 years ago, we should have sent an army of psychologists into police departments up, you know, head to toe uh, uh, analyzing racial bias, PTSD, trauma, you name it, 60% of the police in this country would have their badges pulled away. That's what needs to happen. But the reality is, and this is a whole other discussion, the police are there to protect capitalists, capitalism and property. I give you standing rock. So Joe Biden, it's not all his fault. This is centuries and centuries, but Biden's not going to do anything. Uh, I mean, Obama didn't do anything. And a lot of these uh, Black Lives Matter started under him. 
So mm -hmm. I think the time for a conversation is long over. We need to demand action. Uh, and I don't know what form that takes, but there's going to be more Elijah McClain's. And frankly, there's a whole lot more George Floyd's we don't even know about.